Okay, uh, so in today's session, uh, we'll be dealing with scientific aptitude. So I hope you can see the presentation to now, PPT file. Okay, yeah. So to begin with, uh, we'll be discussing uh, scientific aptitude in, uh, in today's session. So uh, what exactly is scientific aptitude? Basically, uh, questions from scientific aptitude comprise of questions from uh, elementary physics, chemistry, and biology. These are the sort of questions you could easily answer if you are just familiar with all your science concepts from school. So uh, none of these questions are going to be like, you know, problem based questions. Most of them are like very simple ones. Like uh, you'll, you'll get an idea of the questions uh, that appear in this exams. So you now let's start this, this session now. Okay. okay. The first question is the change in color of the stars occurs due to, for example, if you see, if you look at this, uh, stars in the sky in the night some colors uh, some stars appear brighter some stars appear to uh, appear to be having a different color okay so the question is what is the reason for this is it due to fluctuations in their composition and size or is it due to irregular absorption or scattering in earth's atmosphere or is it due to variation in the surface temperature or is it due to variation in the distance from the earth I repeat the question. When you look at the stars in the night, uh, night sky, you would see that like you know, uh, different stars are, are composed of different colors. Some appear to be a bit red. Some appear to be yellow. Some appear to be blue. So the question is, what is the uh, reason behind it? Can anyone answer? Agra Ranchi. Okay, Agra and Raji say irregular absorption of or scattering in Earth's atmosphere. Mm, the, the answer to this is the color of a star depends on the surface temperature on its surface temperature. For example, the higher the temperature, the, the more bluish tinge the star requires. So in fact, the hottest of the stars, the stars with whose temperature goes beyond millions of degrees, they have blue. And in the stars that are comparatively cooler, their color would be red. In fact, the order is, I'll just uh, type the order of the coloring of the stars. If you can just give me a minute. Okay. Uh, blue, hottest stars. And the order is blue greater than white greater than green greater than yellow greater than orange greater than red. Most of the questions comprise of uh, like you know uh, which one of the like you know the only possible type of question that could appear on this topic in particular is whether like you know is regarding the blue and red. The coolest of the stars are red in color whereas the hottest are blue in color. Okay. I hope the concept is clear. See, the, the higher the temperature of the star, the bluer it appears. So, when you are given a set of stars and you know, like let's say particular star is the hottest, it would be blue in color. Okay? Now, so let's go to the next question. This, this is a rather easy question. Let's see who, who can answer. A piece of rock was brought from the moon to the earth. Then, its mass alone changed, its weight alone changed, both the mass and weight changed, neither the mass nor weight changed. Let's see, Agra says, okay, the answer to the previous question was variation of the surface temperature. Answer to question number one is C. Okay. Now, coming to the next question, okay, uh, Ranchi says D, Ranchi says neither the mass nor weight changes, uh, what about you Agra, what do you think 
happens when you bring a piece of rock from moon okay uh i'll tell you this uh, remember this one thing the mass of any particle or any ob object is constant throughout the universe you see uh, it's um, the mass of let's say you have certain object you take it to mars you take it to jupiter you take it to any other planet or you take it to the moon the mass it remains constant whereas weight weight is a function of the gravity of, of the planet in which you are residing in for example if you go to the moon you will be feeling much lighter okay because the gravitation pull of the moon is less when compared to that of the earth because of that reason when you go to the moon you will be feeling lighter on the other hand if you go to jupiter you would be feeling a lot heavier right so weight is equal to mass times gravity or w equals mg see so basically weight is a function of gravitational force so when the rock is was brought from the moon to the earth its weight alone changed the mass mass remains constant whereas the weight weight has changed weight weight has changed so the right answer to this question is b is that clear is that clear alga okay so now if, if my question is uh did the weight of the rock increase or decrease when it was brought from uh, brought from moon to earth what would your answer be if a rock was brought from moon to earth would its weight increase or decrease increase yes that's right perfect anchi the weight would increase because the on earth the force of gravity is much higher than that of moon and in general the uh, the larger a planet is the higher its gravitational force will be right so if i if my question is if i take an object from earth to mars will the force of uh, will the weight increase or decrease the answer is decrease because mars is a smaller planet similarly if i take a rock from earth to jupiter the weight will increase because jupiter is a bigger planet than earth got it okay the key formula is weight w equals mass times gravity or mg okay now let's move on to the next question voltmeter is used to measure a potential difference b electric capacitance c specific gravity d none of these okay uh, agra says b uh, what about you ranchi ranchi says a and the right answer is a because voltmeter is used to measure potential difference between two ends but for example if you look at any battery you would see 1.5 volts 2.5 volts what it means is within a battery you have a positive terminal and negative terminal right so the potential difference between them is to if you if, I, uh, if, a, if it reads 1.5 v it means the potential difference between the two ends is 1.5 volts technically speaking it means that if you have to take a charged particle from one end to other end you have to do that much amount of work but you don't have to bother with that just remember that volts is used to measure potential difference so voltmeter is used to measure potential difference right and uh, i'll ask you one more question what is the instrument that is used to measure detect current what is the can someone tell me what is the instrument that is used to detect current ranchi agra can anyone of you answer this question which instrument is used to detect current ammeter that's right ranchi yes ammeter can be used to detect current right and what about galvanometer how many of you have heard of galvanometer both in fact galvanometer is a uh, 
is a sensitive ammeter right so both ammeter and galvanometer are used to measure current right and voltmeter is used to measure potential difference okay this is an important thing it's easy because voltmeter and volt volts are for potential difference right and uh, can someone tell me what is the unit of current what is the unit of current ohm uh, raji ohm is a unit for resistance okay ohm is a unit of resistance okay uh, the unit of current is ampere or amp okay ampere is a unit of current okay now remember this thing ohms they are uh, units of resistance and current current units are amperes and uh, how many of you know the ohms law ohms law is a straight forward law that states v equals i r that is the if uh, let's say we have two points a and b okay if you have let's say two points a and b right now let's say current is flowing from a to b right now current is flowing from a to b in this direction okay let's call the magnitude of current i so like it could be let's say 3 amperes 4 amperes whatever now now the resistance of the wire the current flowing in the wire and the potential difference between the two ends can be related using the ohms law which states that the potential difference between two ends is equal to the product of resistance between the two ends and the current flowing between the two ends okay this this is a this is a sort of question that could actually appear in the examination they could ask you a simple question the potential difference between two ends is 10 volts and the current flowing between the two ends is 2 amperes what is the resistance between the two ends so it's a straight forward application just write down write down the formula v equals ir and substitute the values you'll find the unknown okay now let's move to the next question yeah which of the following quantities is transferred from one place to other by waves is it energy is it wavelength is it velocity is it mass the waves uh, you could have heard of you know the most common example is let's say the c waves right so uh, what is transferred in waves ranchi says b and now it says a agla yes in fact the right answer is a waves transfer energy they don't transfer mass whereas wavelength and velocity they are the characteristics of the wave okay wavelength frequency speed velo velocity these are the characteristics of the wave and that's why you know you could you could say waves as energy in motion all waves do is they transport energy from one point to other through a series of vibrations okay they don't transport mass all right now let's move on to the next question the si unit of temperature is the answer to the previous question is a okay now the standard international unit of temperature is is it fahrenheit is it kelvin is it celsius is it rankine
Okay, Ranchi is uh, Agra says C and Ranchi says B. And the right answer is in fact B, Kelvin. Though for, for all practical purposes, we use Celsius. Celsius is used in all the uh, like you know Commonwealth countries, India, England, and everywhere, centigrade or Celsius. Whereas Fahrenheit is used in you uh, other countries of Europe and mostly America. Okay, but the standard international unit, the actual uh, SI unit is Kelvin. Okay, and in fact, zero Kelvin is equal to minus 273 degrees centigrade. I'll just type it for you. Zero Kelvin is equal to minus 273 degrees Celsius. Zero Kelvin is also known as absolute zero. Please note this point too. Zero Kelvin is what is referred to as absolute zero. At absolute zero, everything comes to a standstill. Like even the, all the atoms, molecules, they stop, uh, they stop their motion. They just stand still. There is absolutely zero energy. Okay. So it, this is not something that could be achieved in uh, by us humans. We uh, in laboratories we could go. Uh, we went up till one Kelvin or two Kelvins, but never we never we have not, never actually reached absolute zero. Okay. Now moving on, next question. Yeah. Let's see who can answer this. When you're jumping out of a moving bus, you should run for some distance in a direction. Which direction should you jump in? Like let's say you're, about, you're, you're jump, trying to jump out of a moving bus. Okay. Now, uh, which direction should you jump? You should jump. Should you jump in the direction opposite to the motion of the bus? Or should you jump, jump in the direction in which the bus is moving? Or you should not jump at all, you should not run at all, or should you go perpendicular to the direction? Yes, the right answer is B. In fact, the reason for this is inertia. You see, when you are traveling in a bus, along with the bus, you also have the velocity. So when you're traveling the bus, let's say it's going at the speed of 60 kilometers per hour, you also effectively have a velocity of 60 kilometers per hour, right? Now, so let's say you got out of the bus. Now let's say if you try to stop suddenly, now you don't. Let's consider all the cases. If you don't try, uh, if you don't uh, run and try to stop suddenly, since because of the inertia, because of the fact that you already have speed, if you try to stop, you're going to fall fall down, right? On the other hand, if you actually try to run along the, in the direction in which the bus is moving, you are effectively controlling your speed because you are already in that direction and you are still going in that, that direction, right? So there is a very less chance of you falling down. So the right answer is B. Okay. Let's, let's move on to the next question. The jet plane engine works on which of the following uh, on the principle of conservation of which physical quantity? Is it mass? Is it angular momentum? Is it gravitation? Is it linear momentum? Okay. Uh, Agra says B. And Ranchi says C. See, uh, first of all, there is no such thing as conservation of gravitation. Gravitation is a field, it's a force, so there is no, uh, there's no question of conservation. There are only three conservation laws uh, in physics, the, the most common ones. One is the conservation of mass, that is, mass cannot be destroyed. Neither, it can be neither produced nor destroyed. The other is conservation of linear momentum, and the other is the conservation of angular momentum. But the concept that works in jet engine is conservation of linear momentum okay like uh, because as the as the rocket fuel burns out the velocity keeps on increasing so it, it provides a thrust okay so answer to this question is d
Now, uh, moving on to the next question. Bernoulli's equation is important in the field of in which field of physics do you encounter Bernoulli's equation? See, uh, I, uh, CL Agra, right? you want me to explain the previous question, right? Consider, consider it this way, I'll give you a simple example. Let's say uh, you are on a skateboard, right? Uh, let's say you are standing on a skateboard and you are, and you have uh, you have a few balls in your hand, right? Right now you are stationary, you are just uh, standing there. Now what happens if you throw a ball in one direction, right? You are standing on a skateboard on let's say on a smooth surface. Now when you throw a ball in one direction, you will be moving in the other direction, right? Because when there are no external forces acting on you, right? If a part of your body attains a velocity in one direction, the other part tries to go in the other other direction, so that momentum is conserved. Similarly, in a jet plane, what it does is uh, when the fuel burns, when the fuel burns, it ejects gases at high velocity in one direction, right? So uh, from the engine. The, the gases come uh, from the nozzle, sorry, from the nozzle, gases come out at high velocity in one direction. So because of that, the jet plane moves in the forward direction, the other direction. You get it? When it's stationary, when there is no fuel, uh, when, there's no, when there are no gases coming out of the nozzle, the plane is stationary. But when once the fuel is burned, and the gases are ejected out, when the gases are going in this direction, the aeroplane moves in this direction, right? So that's why it's conservation of linear moment. Okay. Agra, uh, is it clarified now? Okay. So th that's why, like, like I said, if you want to visualize, uh, like imagine yourself on a, uh, on a skateboard on a smooth surface. When you th and if you throw some object in one direction, you'll be moving in the opposite direction. Or you could, uh, you might have heard of the recoil of guns. When, if you have ever tried to shoot a gun, you would understand. Like when you shoot some, when you shoot, shoot a, when you fire a round, the gun automatically recoils and it actually hits you. Because the bullet has gone in one direction, the gun recoils in the other direction. Even that is based on the principle of linear momentum. Okay, conservation of linear momentum, that is. Okay, now the next question. In which field of physics, do you encounter Bernoulli's equation? It's an easy peasy question. You uh, you must have come across it in 9th or 10th standard. Uh, the, just the name would have been mentioned. In 11th and 12th, you would be dealing with uh, in detail. Yes, Agra has got it right. The answer is B. Bernoulli's theorem equation, uh, it's, it's ba it basically depicts the flow of liquids. It's in, it comes in fluid dynamics. Okay. It, it deals with uh, the streamlines and the velocity with which this uh, the liquid flows through a, at a particular point. Okay, so Bernoulli's theorem or the Bernoulli's equation is related with fluids or flow of liquids. Okay, you never encountered this. Okay, uh, but then you should remember this thing. It's uh, flu in fluid dynamics. I mean, like in level class, you might be studying a bit, bit in detail. If you uh, opted for physics, that is, but in 10th, 9th, 10th, that it would have been mentioned at least. Okay, so remember this: Bernoulli's equation deals with the flow of liquids. Okay, so the right answer is B. Now let's see, two bodies M and M are allowed to fall from the same height. If the air resistance for each is the same, then what will happen? Will M reach the ground earlier, capital M uh, reach the ground earlier, or body with small, mass small M reach the ground earlier, or will both reach the ground simultaneously? Or either of them may reach first depending upon their shape. What is the right answer?
let's see uh, ranchi says b m will reach the ground earlier what about you agra even agra says b uh, and uh, can i know the reason see uh, let's uh, i'll just draw it on the board here now let's say this is the big rock bigger rock let's call capital m right and let's say this is a small rock right now what are the forces acting on the big big rock there are like two forces acting on it one is the weight of gravity right which is equal to capital m times g uh can you see the drawing on the ppt mg right this is acting on node similarly on the small rock the gravity force that is acting is is equal to small m times g right now there is uh, there is another force also that is acting on both of them what is it f a resistance let's call it let's call it x okay now the, the force is acting on the small rock too right so effectively the force acting on big rock is capital mg minus x because mg is downwards and the a resistance is upwards right similarly for the small rock too the effective force acting is small m times g minus f x the a resistance right now so what would be the acceleration of this thing the big rock uh, from newton's first law from newton's second law of motion we can say acceleration of acceleration of big rock is equal to mg minus a resistance force divided by capital m right from newton second law acceleration of big rock is net force divided by mass right which is equal to g minus capital f by capital m right and similarly acceleration of small rock is equal to g minus capital f by small m right now if you look at this g minus f by capital m and g minus f by small m which of these numbers is bigger we know that m is bigger than m right capital m is bigger than small m that's what is given right so f by capital m would be smaller than f by smaller m see uh, i'll just explain to you here since m is greater than small m capital m is greater than small m we have capital f by capital m is less than capital f by small m is this clear since m is greater than m f by capital m is less than f by small m right let's say if you have uh, if you have quantity 60 60 divided by 12 is less than 60 divided by 5 right because 12 is greater than 5 right so acceleration of first rock uh, the bigger rock would be g minus f by capital m and acceleration of second rock would be g minus f by small m uh Agra and Ranji, are you are you following the steps? 
acceleration of now uh, to make it clear I'll, I'll explain you we, we know that f by m is less than f by small m right so we can say g minus f by m is greater than g minus f by small m it's understood let's say uh, if 3 3 is uh, 2 is less than 3 right so 10 minus 2 will be greater than 10 minus 3 right if you are like let's say two numbers let's say f by capital m is 2 and f by small m is 3 right 2 is less than 3 now 10 minus 2 would be of 8 will be greater than 10 minus 3 right so which means acceleration of big rock is greater than that of small rock right so big rock, the bigger rock the rock with mass capital m it will be moving faster so in fact capital m will reach the ground earlier understood if the air resistance for both of them is same then the heavier rock will, will reach the ground earlier now if there is uh, what how about this question if there is no air resistance at all if there is no air resistance at all which rock will uh, reach the ground earlier If there is no air resistance at all, so uh, Ranti understood it, right? So when there is air resistance, like what we encounter in real life, the heavier object will fall first. But if there is no air resistance at all, then both of them will hit the ground at the same time, right? So in fact, if you do the experiment in vacuum, you drop. A one kg stone and you drop a feather both of them will reach it with the earth uh, in the ground at the same time but this is only in vacuum when there is no air resistance got it okay let's move to the next question now hmm. when light travels from air into a glass slab there is no change in its Okay, the answer to the previous question would be A. Answer to previous question is A. Okay. Now let's look at this question. The question says when light travels from air into a glass slab, there will be no change in which of the following features. Okay, Ranji says C. And even Agra says C. Yes, the right answer is C in fact. There is change in wavelength and there is change in speed. Because light, uh, light travels fast, fastest in vacuum a bit slowly when there is air got it and whenever it changes uh, let's say light and uh, enters a glass slab it refracts and its speed changes and its wavelength changes but its frequency remains constant right so the right answer is c The unit of brightness Can anyone tell me this? This is an easy question You have encountered this in school again The standard unit of brightness or illumination or illuminance is lux It's a measure of brightness of a light source Okay 
So the answer to this question is C and not B. The answer is C. Okay, lux is the unit of brightness or illumination. Okay, let's look at this question. Of the following media, the speed of sound will be greatest in in which of the following media will sound have its highest velocity? <clears throat> See, Ranchi says air. And what about you? What about the what about Agra? Which of the following medium? The sound have its highest velocity. Yes, Agra, the right answer is A. Sound, sound, the, the velocity of sound is highest in solid bodies followed by liquids and air. In fact, so the highest velocity is in a metal bar because it's a solid. And uh, can anyone tell me what is the speed of sound in air? At normal in no, under normal uh, uh, atmospheric conditions, what is the sound uh, sound of uh, sorry speed of sound in air? It's three thirty meters per second. You're pretty close. It's actually three forty. The speed of sound it varies between three thirty to three forty. Three thirty to three forty based upon based on the humidity of the air, the composition of the air. So you can safely say 330. 330 is the right answer too. Okay? Because there is no fixed speed. Because as you know, the composition of the air changes, right? Sometimes uh, uh, the air can be very humid. Sometimes it can be dry. So the average speed lies somewhere between 330 and 340. 330 and 340 meters per second. Remember this. And uh, can someone tell me what is the speed of light? The speed of light in vacuum. Can someone tell you what is the speed of light in vacuum? Anyone? Ranji says it's zero. No, no, Ranji, that's uh, not the right answer. The, the speed of sound in vacuum is zero. Remember, sound waves they need a med, uh, they need a medium for propagation. So the, if I ask you, the question is. What is the speed of sound in vacuum? Speed of sound in vacuum that is equal to zero. But on the other hand, speed of light, speed of light is a constant in vacuum and is equal to three lakh kilometers per second. Uh, I'll just take a break for a few minutes here. Yeah, uh, my apologies for the interruption. Yeah, uh, the speed of sound in air is speed of sorry speed of sound in vacuum is zero, right? And speed of light in vacuum is three lakh kilometers per second. Okay. And when you convert it into miles, it would be 1,86,000 miles per second. Okay? Remember this. Sound always needs a medium to propagate, whereas light doesn't need. 
Okay. Now, and the answer to this question is A. Sound travels fastest in solid bodies. Now, moving on. One gram weight is equal to how many dynes? Dyne is a unit of force again. It's, it's, uh, it's used to measure force. Okay. Now the answer the question is what is the how much uh, in dynes? What is the weight of one gram? Okay, uh, Ranji says A. The right answer is 981 dynes because it comes from the following formula. One Newton is equal to one kg meter per second square is equal to 10 to the power 5. This is not 105. One Newton. One Newton is equal to one kg meter per second square is equal to 10 power 5 times or 1 lakh times. Right. So now when you convert it to 1, one gram weight, that, that will turn out to be 981 days approximately. Okay. So the right answer to this is B. Uh, in fact, the question is not phrased properly here because one gram weight, it means that like, you know, uh, weight in terms of, uh, uh, how do you put it, in terms of force, like, you know, the magnitude of force, it's not, not as weight you should see. When you, uh, the important formula you should remember is one Newton is equal to one kg meter per second square is equal to one lakh times. So based on that, you get the answer 981. Okay. It's, uh, it's basically a unit of cent, uh, CDS system, centigra uh, centimeter gram second system of units, okay? Or is it, it's equal to 10, 10 micronewtons, okay? Now moving on to the next question. Which of the following atoms contains only one electron? This is the first chemistry question we are, we are going to discuss now. So rather simple question, the question is which of the following atoms contain only one electron? Okay, Agra says B and Ranti says A and I am afraid Agra you are wrong. The right answer is B because hydrogen is the only atom that has one electron. If you look at oxygen, oxygen on the other hand has 8 electrons, argon I think it has 28, krypton has more than 70. The answer is hydrogen. Hydrogen which stand, whose symbol is H has only one electron. Okay. And which, uh, can someone tell me which atom has two electrons? Anyone? Helium, exactly. Right, Ranchi. Helium has two electrons. And in fact, since uh, both hydrogen and uh, helium have very few electrons and protons, they are very light. That's why they are used in gas balloons. You might have heard of these hydrogen balloons and helium balloons. They are called so because these balloons are filled with that gas. Since th uh, since this hydrogen and helium air uh, weighs even less than that of normal air, it, it, it goes up in the air. That's why both hydrogen and helium balloons float in the air. Okay, the next question, what is the major component of cooking gas? The major component in cooking gas, 
that's right ranjit got the right answer it's butane butane is a major component in cooking gas the lpg gas lpg gas cylinders liquefied petroleum gas cylinders you, you find in it butane is the most uh, is the is the biggest component okay that let's look at this question which of the following varieties of coal has minimum carbon content in it is it peat is it anthracite is it lignite or is it bituminous which of the following coals has the lowest carbon content in it anyone the right answer is peat a a is the right answer in fact peat contains uh, something around 60% coal okay yes that's right that's right ranji peat is the right answer now let's go to the next question which of the following pairs are isotopes okay can can anyone tell me uh, what is the definition of isotope the defi definition of isotope isotope uh, can someone tell me the definition of isotope isotopes are basically variants of a particular ke uh, chemical element they have the same number of protons and electrons but the the, the, dif uh, the difference lies in the number of neutrons okay so for example uh, so in this question which pair is isotopic see uh, i'll tell you the answer if you're not aware of it the right answer is hydrogen it's not ice and steam ice and steam are different states of the same matter right they are not isotopes the right answer is c or oh, it's written as b in fact yes the right answer is c or hydrogen and deuterium okay oxygen and ozone they are entirely different molecules oxygen molecule oxygen molecule has uh, is formula is o2 and ozone is o3 yeah there is a mistake here instead of c it was typed as b so the, yes the right answer is hydrogen and deuterium the third one for hydrogen is called tritium it has even one more extra neutron okay the third is to the name of the third is of hydrogen is tritium okay and uh duty uh it, we all know h2o is referred to as water right Sim which is nothing but h2o is nothing but hy uh, dihydrogen monoxide similarly there is d2o d2 in d2o instead of hydrogen you have deuterium and it, it is referred to as heavy water d2o is referred to as heavy water because d2o is heavier it's, it, it is also water but it is heavier than the normal water and heavy water is used in cooling nuclear plants remember this thing this is an important question one of the most common uses of d2o or heavy water is it is used in cooling in in cooling the nuclear plants okay yeah let's see who can answer this question 
An element contains 18 electrons and its mass number is 40. Then the number of protons and the number of neutrons it is. Then a certain element, it has 18 electrons and its mass is mass number is 40. The question is the number of pro what is the number of protons and the number of neutrons in this element? Ranchi, Agra, you might need a you might need pen and paper, but you should be able to uh, answer it easily. Okay. Agra says the answer is B. Okay. Uh, and whereas Raki says the answer is B. Now the right answer is in fact B. Because in any neutral atom, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. Right? So if there are 18 electrons, then, then there should be 18 protons. Now the weight of an atom is made up of only protons and neutrons. Right? So now we don't know the number of neutrons. Let's call it x. Let the number of neutrons be x. Then we have 18 plus x is equal to 40. Or x is equal to 40 minus 18 is equal to 22. Got it? Because the weight of an atom consists is made up of only protons and neutrons. Right? So total weight is 40 and there are as many protons as there are uh, as there are electrons. So the number of neutrons is 40 minus 18 is equal to 22. Okay? Is that clear Agra and Ranji? Okay. So let's move on to the next question. Yeah. How many electrons are present in the nucleus of uranium? Let's see who can answer this question. How many electrons are present in the nucleus of uranium? This is a very tricky question. Think about it twice and answer. Read every word carefully. How many electrons are present in the nucleus of uranium? Okay, so okay, Ran Agra says A and Ranji says B and D. Yes, the right answer is D because all the electrons are present outside the nucleus. They are present inside the atom, so that's why you should read the question carefully. The, all the electrons are present outside the nucleus, so inside the nucleus, the answer is zero. So I say the question is, how many electrons are present in uranium atom? Then the answer is A, 92. Okay, and 238 is the atomic weight of uh, uranium. 92 is the atomic number of uranium. And 238 is the atomic weight. And the answer to this question is D. Okay, the next question. Which one of the following metals is extracted using smelting? Which one of the following metals? And first of all, you should know what smelting is. Smelting is, is basically a form, it's a, it's a metallurgical process. It, it is used to produce metal from its ore. Ore, when you uh, actually do some mining, you, you extract only the ore. The ore uh, would be like, you know, it would be full of impurities and stuff. So, when you do smelting to extract the iron, okay? And similarly, you use it to extract copper too. Right, so the right answer is C. Okay, so basically this is used to extract metals. 
right sodium and ca calcium they are not metals and it, it's particularly used for extraction of iron and copper okay so right answer is c let's go to the next question yeah electrolysis of water is a what is the physical change is it a chemical change is the radioactive change or is it none of above okay ranchi says it's a and even agra says a okay now uh, the answer to this question is actually both a and b now the question is is it an is the re electrolysis of water is a physical reaction chemical reaction then the answer would be b because what happens in electrolysis is when electricity is passed water is decomposed into hydrogen and oxygen right so it's actually a chemical reaction right so the change is chemical but actually you see that the substance is also changed right physically from water it becomes gas right so the most appropriate answer to this would be b chemical change okay and in fact it undergoes physical change too but the appropriate answer to this would be chemical change see uh that's why i said it undergoes physical change too but the actually when you look at it what uh, what what is chemical change is the root root of the reaction see only because because of the chemical change the physical change occurs right you understood it goes first of all a chemical reaction takes place that splits water into hydrogen and oxygen because of that the physically also water changes water changes to vapor water changes to gas right so and uh, deep inside it's a chemical reaction following which physically also it changes right so the question is electrolysis uh, which of electrolysis of water is a dash reaction then you should say chemical reaction but if is the question is electrolysis of water is a dash change it, uh, it's again chemical change but yes physical change too but uh, from the examination point of view you should always go for chemical change okay Th that's why i said the question is not framed properly it should have been actually reaction instead of change okay so the answer is electrolysis is a chemical reaction that leads to physical change okay now let's go to the next question hmm. which of the following is a chemical change solvent extraction of oil from mustard seeds distillation of water freezing electrolysis of water and freezing of water right the answer is obvious right electrolysis distillation of water is just purification so there is no chemical change freezing of water it's again it's a physical change freezing of water is a physical change because from liquid state okay uh, jaipur has just entered now uh, it seems they had issues with internet okay jaipur uh, we uh, we are actually providing a recording of the entire session so uh, you could contact the head office sometime later then you will be able to provide the recording session of the entire video okay now uh, as we were discussing in the last pro the last question we uh, we discussed that electrolysis of water is a chemical change because water the molecule h2o is split into its individual molecules hydrogen and oxygen okay so the answer to this question is c and uh, jaipur i suggest you to uh, coordinate with head office sometime later so that uh, we can provide you with the video that is recorded okay 
we won't be conducting the session again but uh, you would be able to access the video recording of this entire session okay you may attend the rest of the session too you may attend the rest of the session from now on but for the questions you have missed you can contact the head office later we will be providing you with the recorded session of this entire video okay now let's uh, moving on to the next question stainless steel is an alloy of dash chromium and nickel by mixing in fact chromium and nickel into a certain thing you get stainless steel right uh, what is meant by stainless steel stainless steel is uh, is something is a grade of iron in fact that doesn't rust right it's an alloy of iron and how do you make it see a uh, normal iron when you expose it to uh, air it becomes rusted because it reacts with oxygen in the air to form iron oxide right whereas when you add chromium and nickel to it these metals chromium and nickel they prevent iron from oxidizing so that's why stainless steel doesn't rust right and the right answer to this is b iron okay now let's see uh, this is a rather easy question now on the uh, we need to match the following uh, data on the left side of the call on the left column we have the names of the uh, elements aluminum potassium iron and arsenic and on the right side we have the the symbols symbols of the latin names okay so you are you are required to match this thing let's see who can match okay first one is obvious aluminum you can say like you know the symbol is al so one should be four right and of all the four options there is only option b has four for one so you know even if you don't know the other values you could try to say like you know b is the right answer anyway let's just discuss iron the latin name of iron is ferrum that is fe okay and potassium the latin name of potassium is kalium or k okay and arsenic is as so the right answer is for one it is four for potassium two it is three for iron it's ferrum 1 and 4 it is 3 sorry 4 it is 2 okay just uh, remember symbol for potassium is not p it's k kalium okay let's move on to the next question now which of the following is known as laughing gas which of the following is known as laughing gas is it nitrous oxide it is it nitrogen dioxide is it nitrogen or is it nitrogen monoxide yes the right answer is in fact nitrous oxide nitrous oxide uh, when anyone inhales the fumes it gives a kind of euphoric reaction you, you sort of feel happy and start laughing like a madman uh back then in fact in olden days when there was no anesthetic it is particular it was especially used while performing surgeries in particular dental surgeries so that the patients won't feel any pain these days we got better anesthetics so that we don't use it much we don't use it more right now nitrous oxide is presently used in uh, in canisters and cans the like you know in packaging the contents of aerosol sprays okay so the, the laughing gas is nitrous oxide and can someone tell me what is the chemical formula or molecular formula of nitrous oxide Anyone Agra, Jaipur, Ranchi? 
what is the chemical formula of nitrous oxide is it no is it n2o is is it no2 that's right it's n2o n2o is a molecular formula of nitrous oxide okay and no and nitrogen dioxide it's no2 because dioxide means two oxygens right and nitrogen monoxide mono means one so nitrogen monoxide formula is no and the formula of nitrogen is n2 okay now we'll, we'll be discussing biology questions which among the following is the body's instant energy provider let's see uh, even if you don't the right answer is yes raji it's liver even if you don't know like you could kind of guess it because lungs are mainly used for respiration heart is for pump circulation right pumping the blood to all the organ organs and stomach well stomach is used for digestion and liver and the, uh, when you eliminate all the options the answer is liver and you should know the compound also liver stores a compound called glycogen this is the one this is a compound that burns glucose in our body and converts into energy let me type it for you glycogen okay glycogen basically converts glucose and provides us with energy okay it's a, it's a chemical compound called glycogen it is stored in the liver which the body converts into glucose and burns to provide energy now moving on elisa test is used to detect which of the following diseases elisa test is used to detect which of the following diseases let's see no it's not pneumonia elisa is used to detect aids is the standard test that's used all over worldwide and i'm giving you the full form here enzyme linked immunosorbent assay that's the full form of elisa test and it is used to detect aids the right answer is b elisa okay uh moving on which of the following is the hardest substance of the body which of the fo following is the hardest part substance of your body the straight raji enamel enamel and enamel covers our teeth the exposed part of our teeth and is considered the hardest part of, of our body okay teeth enamel teeth by themselves we can't consider the singular entity whereas enamel is the one that covers our teeth right so the right answer to this is c okay. now let's give you a brief uh, copy brief definition of it to you for your convenience enamel is basically a hard ceramic which covers the export exposed part of our teeth okay now uh, we go to the next question as rickets is to vitamin goiter is to what see rickets is caused due to vitamin deficiency right now goiter is caused due to which deficiency in fact i'll give you a hint rickets is caused because of iodine deficiency uh, sorry goiter
goiter is caused due to iodine deficiency so all you need to know is what is iodine is it water no it's definitely not water is it mineral is it ore or is it a fat iodine is a mineral right so the right answer is b okay goiter is caused due to iodine deficiency okay and what is the biggest source of iodine to our body where do we get our daily dose of iodine we don't go to the medical store and take a bottle of iodine and drink it right right none of us do that salt salt that's right that's right ranchi salt is a, a common source of iodine for all of us Moving on, let's go to the next question. Bones are pneumatic in which of the following animals? Reptiles, amphibians, apes, and mammals. Bones are pneumatic now. Uh, reptiles you understand right reptilian creatures with cold blooded amphibians you know and what about apes can can someone tell me what is the meaning of like you know what animals fall under apes the right answer to this is apes okay answer is apes or c but can someone tell me what is the meaning of apes apes are nothing but it's a it's a scientific word exactly that's right jaipur birds are referred to as apes okay birds are the ones that are referred to as apes okay and and basically uh, the birds the, the bones of the birds the, they contain they contain hollow cells full of air so that's why you know the the bones are pneumatic in the bird sorry bones or pneumatic in the birds now uh, let's move to the next question rice is a fruit known as anyone rice is a fruit known as in fact uh, rice wheat corn oats and barley all of them fall under the same category is it a follicle is it a pom is it a cryopsis or is it a drupe okay uh ranji says d and jaipur says a follicle is hair so that's not the right answer no it's not follicle the right answer is cryopsis it's c basically a cryopsis is a one seeded fruit or grain okay cryopsis is is a is basically a one seeded fruit okay and the other examples of this include wheat corn oats and barley okay so the right answer is c which of the following is not a constituent of chlorophyll molecule which of the following is not a constituent of chlorophyll molecule four options are magnesium carbon hydrogen and calcium question is which of them is not a part of it okay 
okay we have ranchi says a agra says b and jaipur says c and the answer is d in the chlorophyll mo uh, molecule uh, it contains all three of these magnesium carbon and hydrogen but calcium is not present okay so the right answer is d okay uh, now we come to the end of the session so what i'm going to do is for for the convenience of all of you i'll be sharing this document with all of you okay so uh, just give me uh, just give me a minute i'll share this document you should be able to receive it now ranchi jaipur i'm sending the file Uh, if you on this window next to data operation, there is a tab called file transfer. Okay, uh, you would be able to receive uh, download it from there. If you go to this tab after data operation, there is thing called file transfer. It says the file is transferred. If you double click on it, you'll be able to access the file. I request you all to uh, take a print out of this and go through all the questions once, so that you know you can recollect all the questions we have done today. Okay. so uh, i'll uh, i'll meet you guys soon in the next session till then uh, best of luck with your preparation and uh, jaipur please coordinate with uh, someone in the head office you can uh, contact with sukhinder she would be helping you with uh, providing you the video of the uh, entire session we in fact uh, as a matter of fact we are going to upload this session to the sis in the student information system of all the student all the bbs students but before that since you missed this session you can just drop a request at the head office we will provide you the uh, video recording of this session for free okay okay that's it for today's session guys uh, i hope you learned something from today's session okay wish you all the best and see you soon bye